the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thy eyes with thyself, that thou mayest see. Now, I've titled my message today, Thank You, I've Eaten. And I'm sure a lot of people heard me read that passage, and they're thinking, Thank You, I've Eaten. <laughs> Where does that come from out of that passage? I hope you'll see momentarily. If you'll bow your heads with me one more time, Father, once again, God, we come before you on this occasion. Lord, 17 years I have stood in the pulpit in this city and I have sought God with all that is within me to preach the good news, the positive news, the constructive news, the reconciling news of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, it's been our errand to correct false perceptions. It has been our errand, our errand today, God, to uh, speak truth where there has been falsehood spoken in your name in an effort to help those who have become disenfranchised, those, Lord, who have become wayward, to find their way back to the fold of safety. And, Master, today this has not ever not for a moment been an easy work. There are certainly shortcuts, God, that we could take. There are things we could do. There are compromises we could make in an effort simply to fill the seats. But we have sought, God, to be faithful to the truth of your word. And, Lord, today in our faithfulness we have suffered loss in our faithfulness. We have suffered pain. We've experienced bruising. It's been a difficult time. And Master, as the Word of God would go forth at this hour, honestly, God, I stand before you today with a broken heart, discouraged, somewhat despondent, feeling God at my core almost hopeless, and my faith is being tried today as I feel like it has never before been tried. If I'm to deliver the word of God that you've given me, Lord, I need the anointing more than ever. I need your help today, your strength, your power, your authority to move through me and in me today. To help me, God, to be a faithful voice to that message that you would speak unto the church at this hour. Anoint not only my feeble lips of clay, but also every ear of every hearer, those in this place, those watching by reason of the internet, those who will later watch and listen. For we ask it today in none other than Jesus' wonderful, wonderful name. Amen. Praise God and amen. Jesus Christ declared that he had not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. He said, I am come that they might have life 
and that they might have it more abundantly. Amen. God has promised us more than merely an existence. I don't know about you, but there is nothing worse in this world than feeling like you're going through life and all you're doing is existing. Have you ever felt like that? You ever felt like every day it was you were just trying to stay alive? You know, folks, a lot of people don't like the idea of hunting. They don't like the idea of killing animals to eat them. Uh, I don't share that view, to be honest with you, because people don't understand. Animals exist. They live to exist, and they exist to live. Uh, that is why you can't just walk up to a deer in the wild and start petting it. No, if a deer sees you, I'm driving down the road in the country, you know, I'm driving down the mountain and I'll see a deer in the woods and I'll slow the vehicle down and I'll stop it and I want to get my camera and take a picture, but that deer, Bill, will look at me for all oh, about maybe five seconds and then it'll turn tail and run. Because its instinct is survival. That is the instinct of wild animals. Even a little squirrel. You can't just walk out in your yard and tell a squirrel to come to you and expect it to come. No, it's going to run the other way. You try to walk up to a bird in your backyard and see if that bird just sits there and waits for you to come pin it. It ain't going to happen. No, because wild animals have an instinct, and that instinct is survival. Everything they do is merely to survive. The only species on this planet that has the ability to actually engage in activities that cause us to enjoy life are human beings. I've never one time driven down the road in Oklahoma and seen a cow out in the middle of a field dancing around and doing a jig just because it wants to have fun. Do you hear Have you? Have you ever seen a cow do that? No. I've never seen a cow just start dancing around. I've never seen a deer start whistling or singing. I've never seen a deer strap on a... a uh, parachute so it can jump out of an airplane and enjoy the rush of defying gravity. No, animals don't have that ability. They're not interested in doing things to enjoy their life. Do you follow what I'm telling you? That's not how animals are programmed. Wild animals, no. They merely exist. They struggle to survive every day Every minute is about survival. There is nothing worse for a human being than being reduced to that place in our life where we feel like every day all we're doing is surviving. That is the worst, isn't it? The worst feeling. I'm telling you, I've been there in my life. I've, I've been there at times when it just felt like, Bill, I was just trying to stay alive for one more day. And what a horrible place. We're not wild animals. That's not how we're wired. What a horrible place to be when we're struggling merely to survive. God has promised us more than mere survival. Jesus said, I've come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundant. Oh, I want to tell you, there is good news in the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you learn God's way, if you learn and listen to the teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ, you can not only have a life, but you can have a good life. Amen. You can have a pleasant life. You can have a blessed life. God has in essence today prepared a banquet table before us. Amen. In Psalm 23, the word of God declares, He's prepared a, a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. 
even in the worst circumstances, God feeds us well. Hallelujah. Even in the worst circumstances, God protects us and he cares for us and he looks out for us. In Luke chapter 14, verses 13 through 17, Jesus is speaking and he said, But when thou makest a feast, call the poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind, and thou shalt be blessed. For they cannot recompense thee. For thou shalt be recompensed at the resurrection of the just. And when one of them that sat at meat with him heard these things, he saith unto him, Blessed is he that shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. Then said he, meaning Jesus, unto him, A certain man made a great supper, and bade many, and sent his servant at supper time to say to them, that were bidden, come, for all things are now ready. God has prepared for believers today a banquet. God has prepared a life abundant for you. You know, sometimes people quit church and they quit walking with God and they'll swear up and down that this Christian way doesn't work for them. They'll swear up and down that no, uh, it just doesn't work. The preacher gets up and says all these things, but it just don't work like that in my life. And the thing that makes me laugh is every time I've heard somebody come out with that statement, it's people who are giving God half an effort. I've never one time heard somebody who gave God everything, who really put all their effort into walking with the Lord. I've never heard anybody give God everything say that. Hello now. You see, the word of God said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. But if you've got other things that are stepping ahead of God and the priorities of the kingdom of God, and you wonder why all these things aren't, be added, aren't being added unto you, that's why your priorities are messed up. Got people who, for Johnny... Uh, they're so busy worried about paying the bills. They're so worried about uh, accomplishing goals in their career that when the boss offers them work on Sunday, they immediately accept and figure, oh, well, I won't go to church this week. I'll, I'll just not go to church this week. Because after all, church is dispensable. The house of God isn't that important. The word of God isn't that important. I, I, it's more important that I go to work and make that extra 75 or $80. Hello now. And then they wonder why the blessings don't come to them. They hear the pastor get up and teach and preach and talk about tithing and giving. And do they tithe and give? No. Then they wonder why they're not experiencing the blessing that Johnny and Bill are. <laughs> Hello now. They wonder why nobody's giving them Cadillacs. They wonder why nobody's selling them cars for half of what the car's worth. You know, they wonder why they're not seeing the same level of blessing. They wonder why they continue to struggle with their finances. They continue to struggle with all these things. Well, the answer is simple. You give God half an effort. You're not going to get the full reward. No, God has set a banquet in front of us. Why in the world aren't we eating from this banquet table? Why aren't we enjoying everything that God has prepared for us? The Lord said, come for all things are now ready. Hallelujah. Like the song we sang today. Come and dine. The master calleth. Come and dine. You may feast at Jesus' table all the time. He who fed the multitude turned the water into wine. To the hungry calleth now, come and dine. Years ago, my brother Dallas, my baby brother, lived with me. And we used to go visit a dear saint of God, Sister Chamber. She's gone on to her reward a long time ago. She was in her 80s back when I knew her, and that was 30 years nearly ago. So uh, she's long since gone to glory. 
Dallas and I would go to visit her. And Sister Chambers, bless her heart, was always very liberal and very uh, giving and uh, hospitable, you know, with her resources. And I would tell Dallas, if Sister Chambers offers us lunch, uh, just tell her, no, thank you. Uh, I'm fine. You know, I'm not hungry. Whatever you got to tell her. And I will take you to eat afterwards. Because I'm going to tell you, she had very limited resources. I knew that her freezer, she ate like a bird. You know, she, she ate very little. And if we ate up her food, she wasn't going to have food, you know. So a lot of times she would uh, offer for us, well, why don't you all have dinner with me? And we'd say, oh, no, Sister Chambers, we're okay. We're fine. Sometimes, you know, people will, uh, when they're offered something to eat, they'll say, oh, no, thank you, I've eaten. Hello now. You ever had somebody say, thank you, I've eaten? I'm going to pick on my mother for a minute. <laughs> Mom, I hope, I hope you're not listening for a second. My mother's famous, you know. We'll say, Mom, you want to go to lunch? Well, oh, no, I've eaten. We'll say, well, you know, come on, you can go with it. No, I've eaten. I already had some. All right, well, you know, you could say, well, I suppose I could sit with you. <laughs> so we take her, and we sit down, and Tommy and I order. And Mom says, well, I guess I could have me uh, just, you know, a little old chef salad, and I guess I could have a little bit. Yes. <laughs> you know, sometimes you say, thank you, I've eaten, and that doesn't mean you're necessarily satisfied. That doesn't mean you've eaten to the point that, you know, you couldn't eat something else. Do you follow? I'm not, I'm not being mean to her. I'm just picking on her. But do you know what I'm saying? You know, yes. maybe she did have something to eat, but that didn't mean she wasn't still hungry. She was trying to be nice. She was trying to, to save us a few dollars, and, and she was trying to prevent us from spending money on her, you know, until we got to the restaurant, and then all bets were off. But, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you know, thank you, I've eaten. Yeah. Thank you, I've eaten. A lot of people, God has set a table before them, and a lot of people are looking at the Lord and saying, Thank you, Lord, I've eaten. Hello now. God's got things for us, and yet they have no appetite for those things. Do you hear what I'm telling you now, folks? Oh, no, they, they have no appetite for those things. Now, I'm going to turn this in a slightly different direction today, because this is the message that God has given me. Thank you, I've eaten, is often used to beg out of eating with a host or a hostess, uh, whatever it is that a host or hostess might be offering. Sometimes we say it because what they're offering is not anything we want to put in our mouth. Sometimes we're saying it simply because we're full and we're satisfied and we really don't have room for anything else. Saying this does not fill our stomach. You're only later going to have to find food anyway. Hello now. So whether you're saying it because you are in fact and indeed satisfied and full, or whether you're saying it for any number of other reasons, the bottom line is at some point you're still going to have to go get something to eat. Amen. At some point your hunger is going to return and you're going to have to get something to eat. I've heard many preachers in the Pentecostal and in the apostolic movement claim that the church today is experiencing the best and the greatest move of God that the church has ever seen. Some of the greatest preachers in the apostolic movement that I admire immensely, men of God that I hold in the highest esteem, I'm not going to name their names, because what I'm about to say might seem a little biting. But some of the greatest men of God I've ever known have made that statement in their preaching. Oh, things have never been better. Things have never been greater in the church than they are today. Is that so? Or are you saying, thank you, I've eaten. God has more for the church. And rather than striving for more, and rather than having an appetite for more, are you trying to claim that all is well, and you're perfectly satisfied, and you're full? 
I'm going to tell you it's a dangerous thing today for preachers in our movement. It's a deceptive thing for preachers in our movement to claim that things have never been better. Some of the greatest men of God I know have said this falsehood in an effort to inspire unity and to placate those in the midst of them who were disgruntled. Now listen, but telling the individual who is starving for a genuine move of the Holy Ghost that they've just eaten and should be satisfied when in fact they've done little more than drink a glass of water is a fool's errand. Mm -hmm. Tommy and I went to a meeting one time, a fellowship of Pentecostal churches, a little kind of a loose-knit fellowship that this, organ, this little organization has. And a pastor that we knew, a friend of ours, had invited us to this fellowship. And we went, and they had their services. And their services were nowhere near, not even remotely close to what I know church to be. They were, I mean, Johnny, they, they were a million miles away. I, I listened to preacher after preacher, and I sensed no anointing on the Word of God. I felt no move of God in the worship service. And, of course, they had all the little accoutrements. You know, they had some fool get up there and do a mime, and they had other dance groups get up there and do their little dance routines. You know, now, for those of you watching who are getting mad at me, I'm sorry to tell you, you can hate me all you want to, those things have no business in the worship if you want to do them as a special program or something of that nature, I don't have a problem with that. But I do not believe that mime belongs as part of the worship service. I do not believe that choreographed dancing ought to be part of the worship service. The Word of God said that God desires we worship Him in spirit and in truth. Our worship is to be inspired of the Holy Ghost. It is to be choreographed by the Holy Ghost. When David danced before the Ark of the Covenant, I promise you he did not have Bob Fosse choreograph his dance before he got out there and danced. He leaped and danced with joy and celebration at the Ark of the Covenant being brought into the city of David. Am I telling the truth? So those of you who are into all this modern paraphernalia, what have you, that goes on in the church, I'm sorry, I, I don't have room for those things. I don't believe they belong as part of the worship service. Think of me what you will. But you know what? I felt no anointing in those services. I didn't feel the presence of God. There was no move of the Holy Ghost. But you know what? The preachers to get up and tell me it was there. Man, I'll tell you, haven't we had a wonderful anointing in this meeting? Hallelujah, glory to God. And I wanted to shake my head and say, no. <laughs> Boy, haven't we had a marvelous move of God in this meeting? And I wanted to shake my head and say, no. But I'm, I'm too nice to be rude, so I just sit there and, you know, hold my head still because there was such a temptation. Bill, I mean to tell you, there was such a temptation. We live in a world today where we've got leaders in our government who will tell you the sky is blue when it clearly is black. They'll tell you the sun is shining when it's clearly raining. And somehow or another, there are certain people in our society who have come to believe whatever this fool says. If he says it's raining and the sun is shining, brother, you better believe they think it's raining. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? But you know what? Just because you say something doesn't make it a reality. Just because you say, thank you, I'm full doesn't mean you're in fact full. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? Speaking the words does not make what you've spoken a fact. Many in the church today are saying, oh, I'm full. Everything's good. I'm satisfied. In the apostolic movement, we have what's referred to as holiness folk. 
Now, I was part of that movement myself for a good while, and I'm not trying to be mean, and I'm not trying to pick on them, but I'm going to tell you something, holiness folk. You better listen to me, and you better listen to me real good. You can't be hungry for anything when you think you've had your fill of it. When you come to believe you're holy and you're righteous before God, you no longer hunger for holiness and for righteousness. Hello now. You begin to look toward heaven. You begin to go to church and say, thank you, Lord, I've eaten. Lord, I've eaten. I'm holy as it is. I'm already where I need to be. I've already accomplished what I need to accomplish. I'm already standing where I need to stand. Am I telling the truth? And God said, but I've got a table spread. I've got blessing for you. I've got more for you. And they say, oh, but I don't need more because I'm perfectly fine right where I'm standing. I'm going to tell you something. I know from personal experience that when you're in the holiness movement, a lot of people in the holiness movement have literally come to believe that because their hair is a certain length or they wear their hair a certain way or they wear certain kind of clothes a certain way or they wear their closed-toed shoes, they come to believe that they are just holy in the sight of God. They believe, brother, that I stand before God holy. Well, the only problem is uh, there's a lot more of God's holiness for you to partake of. Amen. There's a lot more of God's holiness for you to digest. There's a lot more of God's holiness for you to make a part of your life. But honey, if you're convinced you've eaten, if you're telling yourself that you're full and you're satisfied, then there's no room for you to partake of anything more that God is offering. No wonder we got a bunch of people in the church today who don't act anything like a Christian ought to act. Who don't live anything like a Christian ought to live. Who don't talk like a Christian ought to talk or walk like a Christian ought to walk. No, because they've come to that place where they've convinced themselves that they are satisfied. They've eaten. I've had enough. Oh, I've, I've had all my fill. I've stood at the master's table and I've eaten all there was to eat. I haven't got room for anything else. How many times have you sat down and had a meal and said, oh my goodness, I don't have room. You know, the waitress comes and said, hey, you got room for dessert? And you say, oh heavens, no, no, no. I'm full as a tick. No room for dessert. Because you've had all you can possibly take. How many Christians today look at the master's table and they say, Oh no, I've had all I can possibly take. No, I'm as holy as I'll ever be. I'm as righteous as I'll ever be. I'm as loving as I'll ever be. I'm as forgiving as I'll ever be. I'm as compassionate as I'll ever be. My goodness, do you hear what I'm telling you? I'm as charitable as I'll ever be. God said, oh, no, 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 there, there's more for you. Oh, but Lord, I, I couldn't touch it. I, I couldn't have any more. Thank you, I've eaten. I, I'm full. I'm satisfied. There's no more room. You cannot hunger today and thirst after anything if you've already had your fill. You don't hunger or thirst for anything when you've had your fill. Amen. I had to stop yesterday on the way back from Oklahoma. I had to stop at McDonald's. I told Tommy, I said, man, I was so hungry. I had eaten kind of early in the morning, and it was getting to be mid-afternoon, and I really should have eaten long before I ate. And I would gotten so hungry, you know, my... My mood swings had settled in. Tommy called me on the phone, and I, ah, I'm not going to chew his head off because my mood swing was in full gear. I desperately needed to eat. Well, I stopped at a McDonald's, and you know, oh, you ever been so hungry, you just can't hardly stand it, you know? And I ordered me a quarter pounder and french fries in a drink, and I ate that quarter pounder and those french fries, and I got in the truck, and I started driving back to Dallas, and I'm driving down the road, and I said, dear God, I'm still hungry. I'm still, you ever done that? 
And I mean, I realized, I said, now normally that quarter pounder would have really done something for me. You know, that those fries that said, but, oh God, I'm so hungry. Well, thank God I used one of them little coupons I had for buy one, get one. If you buy a quarter pounder, you get a free one. So I had another quarter pounder in the bag. I was going to bring it home with me, you know. That booger never made it home. <laughs> Oh, no, 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 it, it didn't make it to the house because I was still hungry. I was still hungry. And I found myself reaching into that bag and letting that quarter pounder loose. And I'm driving down the road, <laughs> chomping on that second quarter pounder because I was so hungry. I started to tell you earlier about the church I grew up in. And the church I grew up in when I was a kid, we had a wonderful move of God. We had a wonderful move of God. Oh, I used to love to go to church as a kid. My God, you never knew what was going to happen. You never knew what was going to transpire. Somebody's going to get healed. Somebody's going to get filled with the Holy Ghost. Some drunk's going to wander into the church and wind up in the altar. And God is going to sober him and save him. Oh, I mean, we had marvelous things happen. Somebody, the Holy Ghost going to begin to move. And people are going to be slain in the Spirit all over the house that God going to be laid out like a bunch of dominoes. I mean, and I was just a kid, and man, I couldn't wait to go to church and see what God was going to do. It was so exciting. Well, as the years passed, the church began to kind of cool down, and the move of God began to wane. And by the time I was a teenager, we didn't have services like that at all anymore. No one near it. And I used to get up over and over and over again and testify in our church and the anointing of the Holy Ghost would come over me and I would begin to prophesy that we were losing the move of God. We were losing the anointing of the Holy Ghost and we had better be mindful of this and we better change course and we better get back to letting God be God and letting the Spirit sweep through the house of the Lord. And I would sound the warning, Johnny, over and over. And people looked at me like I was a roll pain in the neck. I've always been a pain in the neck. If you think I've just been a pain in the neck since I've been an adult or since I started preaching, no. I was a pain in the neck even as a kid. Ask my mother. <laughs> mother, don't you dare post a comment related to that. <laughs> you see, Johnny, I was hungry. I was still hungry. Oh, I was hungry for the move of God we saw when I was a kid. I was hungry for that power that we had when I was young. I was hungry for the kind of services we experienced in my youth. And yet everybody else in that church seemed to be satisfied with a dead old dry church service. With an occasional message in tongues with interpretation. Yippee-i-yay-i-o. And so many in that church came into the house of God and when the Lord would say to them in spirit, do you want a move? Do you want a mighty move of God? They would just look up to heaven and say, oh Lord, thank you, I'm full. Thank you, I've eaten. Oh, I remember those days, Lord. Yeah, those were nice days, but that was then and this is now. I've eaten, Lord. I, I've had those kind of churches. I'm sorry, I still want them. I still want them. Amen. I had steak a couple weeks ago. Don't mean I don't want a steak this week. Hello now. <laughs> Amen. Just because I've eaten something good once in my life don't mean I don't want to eat it again. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? But so many people have become satisfied with the way churches are today. They're satisfied with watered down church service. You go into most apostolic churches today and they're dead as a doorknob. There's no move of God. There's no anointing. If somebody got up and shouted, the preacher probably trying to cast demons out of you. That's how backwards things have gotten. I come to the house of God, I can promise you, I come into this place every single Sunday. I'm not kidding. I'm not joking. 
Johnny, I'm just hoping and praying that this will be the Sunday that we experience an outbreak of the Holy Ghost. It's every Sunday I keep praying, God, let this be the Sunday. Let this be the week. I've told you the story before, but I'll tell it again for those who haven't heard. Jason and I were in a relationship for a few years back when I first started my affirming ministry. And he had come into the apostolic movement. He had received the Holy Ghost. He was baptized in Jesus' name. He loved my preaching. And God began to open doors for me to go into churches and preach mainstream churches. Mainstream churches. Pastors begin to invite. I didn't seek, I didn't ask, I didn't do anything in the universe to try to get into a church to preach, literally. Did absolutely nothing. But we opened up a little learning center in Brooklyn, New York, and uh, apostolic learning center. We had apostolic literature and books, and we had a little coffee shop, and we had a little library there for people to borrow videos and materials like we were trying to do over here near the church on Jamila Road, and it took off like a shot. I mean, it took off like a rocket. We had all kind of preachers coming in and using our facility, and uh, any given moment you walk into the building, we'd have, oh heavens, four, five, six, ten, twelve Christian people standing there talking and visiting and having a good time, and oh, it, it was not a church, but it was a ministry. And I mean to tell you, we, we prayed people through standing next to the cash register. We had people come in that were drug bound, that were bound by drugs and alcohol. And they'd say, I need God to help me. And Jason and I'd get on either side of them. We'd lay hands on them. We'd start praying for them. And God would touch them and deliver them. We had people come into our learning center who came from backgrounds, churches that didn't preach Jesus' name, baptism, and the oneness of God. And we would share with them, and next thing you know, they'd come into the oneness of God. They'd come into Jesus' name, baptism. And to this day, many of those people are part of apostolic churches in the greater New York City area because of the little ministry we had in Brooklyn, New York. But preachers would come in, and they'd fellowship with us, and they'd say, you're a preacher, aren't you? Well, I, I've been backslid for a few years, you know, and I'm just coming back to church and coming back to God, and I was trying to figure out a way to start an affirming ministry, to, to, to minister to people uh, in the LGBT community, and I was trying to feel my way, but I couldn't say no because God had called me to preach, and the Bible and callings of God are without repentance. And you don't deny that you're called if God's called you. So when these preachers say, you're, you're a preacher, aren't you? I'd say, well, yeah, you know, I'm not preaching right now. I'm not pestering anywhere. I'm not evangelizing. I'm not doing anything. They'd say, well, why don't you come preach for me this Sunday? And I'd go preach for them. Next thing you know, I'm being invited to preach in this church. Next thing you know, I'm being invited to preach in that church. And I was being invited to preach all over the place. Next thing you know, Johnny, I was preaching in New Jersey. I was preaching in New York. I was preaching in Connecticut. I was preaching all over that area. I was preaching. Hardly a Sunday went by that I was not preaching somewhere. Well, Jason and I decided one, one Sunday we were going to go visit a large Pentecostal church in New York City. One of the biggest, one of the best. One of the most famous churches. I'm going to go ahead and say its name, and I hope nobody's offended. But it was Brooklyn Tabernacle. You've heard of their choir. They've got uh, all kinds of very famous choir. They've got all kinds of DVDs out and uh, uh, recordings. You can go to any Christian bookstore and buy their choir's recordings. I like, I like their singing. I like their songs. We went to Brooklyn Tabernacle. Oh, I mean to tell you, they had church, and their whole church service was, you know, the music was fairly upbeat. It was similar to what we sing these days, you know. And uh, I think somebody actually gave a message in tongues, and there was interpretation. And we come out of that meeting, and Jason said, oh, boy, that was great. That was terrific. That was wonderful. Boy, have I really eaten today. 
And I looked at him and I said, uh, I'm still hungry. That didn't do it for me. See, I've been to some feasts. I know what a banquet looks like and that wasn't it. So one of these days, Jason, we're going to go to church somewhere and we're going to experience a move of God like I remember. And then you're going to realize that what we just come out of was nothing, literally nothing. Well, then we decided we were going to go visit another mega church, big famous church in New York City, Pentecostal church. We went to David Wilkerson's church down in Times Square. Times Square Church. Boy, I mean, they took an old theater, you know, an old play theater, and they converted it into a beautiful, beautiful place. Beautiful building. It was gorgeous. You know, them old theaters were very ornate and had a lot of ornate uh, artwork and all that, you know, and uh, relief sculptures and all that kind of thing. It was just gorgeous. And boy, the church service was theatrical. I mean, the curtains opened and there was the choir. And by, I mean, you know, it was very theatrical. It was very upbeat. There were people down in the front just bouncing around during the worship service, just bouncing to be bouncing. And we come out of that service and Jason said, Oh, that was fantastic. I've never been in a church service like that. And I said, Really? You're satisfied with that? That did it for you? Now, he grew up Roman Catholic, so he didn't really have a whole lot of point of reference, you know? I said, no, I'm still hungry. I'm still hungry. See, I went to that service hoping for a real move of God. I went to that service hoping that God would be able to really make himself real in that place, that he'd really be able to set out a banquet for us in the Spirit didn't happen. Sometime later, this Spanish Pentecostal preacher that I knew said to me, he said, there's a group of Spanish Pentecostal churches that I know, and they're going to have a fellowship meeting on such and such a Saturday, and there'll be seven Spanish Pentecostal churches coming together to fellowship. Seven different congregations will all be coming together in this one church to have a fellowship meeting. And uh, I've told them about you. And they want you to come preach for their fellowship meeting. Now I had, at that point, I preached in any number of Spanish Pentecostal churches. And most of the time I had to preach with an interpreter. And I'd kind of gotten it down, how to preach with an interpreter, you know, how to keep my thoughts simple and, and concise. You all say, I can't believe for a minute you, you could keep things concise and simple. But I did. And uh, so the interpreter could, you know, could interpret what I was saying in pieces, you know, rather than just spilling out a big long paragraph. I would literally say a sentence and stop. And let him interpret. Then I'd say another sentence and start. You know, and I learned how to do this. And we had wonderful times. Long story short, I don't want to take the time to tell the whole story. I preached in that service. Seven Pentecostal churches. Seven separate churches in one building. I preached that meeting. And at the end, by the end of the sermon... The Holy Ghost was falling all over that building like rain. People were shouting. People were on their feet. People were dancing and under the anointing of the Holy Ghost. People were leaping and jumping. I began to go. The Holy Ghost directed me. I began to go out in the congregation. I lay hands on people. And each time I did it, that person would fall straight down to the ground like they were dead. They would just literally just drop straight down to the ground. Nine people I laid hands on. The ninth person had a demon. And this lady looked at me. She was the last person that I laid hands on that night. And she looked at me and the voice of a demon come out of her and said, Don't you touch me. And then her body turned so that her back was facing me. And I reached around the back of her head. And I had anointed my finger with oil. I reached around the back of her head and I 
put that anointing oil on her forehead and I pulled her head against my shoulder and I said, you unclean spirit, come out of this woman in Jesus' name. Boom. She fell to the floor like a bag of potatoes. The church began to explode. We had a move of God. I mean, the Holy Ghost swept through that place. I was done laying hands on people. I went back to the pulpit and sat on my chair, and I'm just sitting there, and the Spirit of God is just moving and moving and moving and moving. And the pastor who hosted the event got up in the pulpit, and he was trying to, to take the service from there, you know. And he got up, and he burst out weeping. And all he could do is weep. And he literally stood there for about 40, 45 minutes and never said a word, just wept. I looked down at Jason, and I looked at Brother, uh, 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 yeah, the Spanish pastor I knew, the friend of mine, uh, Matos, Brother Matos, and the two of them were just standing there weeping, tears streaming down their face. And the Holy Ghost was moving through that place. Just, you wouldn't believe what was happening in that building. And when that pastor finally began to speak, he said, I have never in my life seen a move of God like this. I have never seen God move like this. I have never seen a church service like this. He said, what God has done in this place tonight is absolutely mind-blowing. He said, I have never seen anything. When Jason and I got in the car that night with Brother Matos and his wife and his Brother Matos' granddaughter, Jason and Brother Matos were still weeping. <laughs> And Jason said, you remember you told me one day we were going to see a church service that was going to make me realize that what we saw at, at uh, Times Square Church was nothing. Remember you told me one day we were going to see a church service <clears throat> where what we saw at Brooklyn Tabernacle wasn't nothing. He said, well, man, today was the day. Oh, my God, I've never seen anything like he said, My God, the power of God in that place was so real. That you could feel literally, all you had to do was be in the room and you could feel the, uh, the electricity of the power of God surging through you. It was amazing. God was healing people. God was touching people. God was filling people with the Holy Ghost. God was delivering people from alcohol and drug addiction. All kinds of things. That's what I know God to be able to do. I went home that night and said, ah. Thank you, I've eaten. <laughs> now I'm satisfied. Because God has promised us life more abundant. He has promised us more than merely going to church and sitting through some old dead dry church service where we're told that we're supposed to believe God is real. No, God said, you don't have to tell nobody I'm real. I'll let them know for myself. Thank you very much. I'll come down and be in the midst of you if you'll allow me. I'll come down and I'll get right in the middle of you. I'll be touching and healing people and delivering people and saving people just like I did when I walked planet Earth as a man. And you'll know I'm real. And it won't be because the preacher said so. It'll be because I have revealed myself. But how many people today have talked themselves into believing that their church has an anointing? How many people today have talked themselves into believing that the move of God is present in their assembly or present in their movement or in their denomination when in fact it is not? They're saying, thank you, I'm full, and therefore they're not partaking of all that God is offering. God says, I've got so much more here. I've got so much more here. Come and dine. Come and dine. I've got so much more here. Oh, Lord, thank you, I'm full. Oh, you're not full there. You, you haven't had nothing. Say, Pastor, you started the service today with Revelation chapter 3, and I still can't understand what that passage has to do with thank you, I've eaten. Well, then let me read to you. The Lord said to the church at Laodicea, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. 
So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Listen. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. Thank you, I've eaten. You're saying, oh, I, everything's good for me. I'm good. Everything's good. Listen, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor. What you're saying does not match the reality. And blind and naked. What you're saying does not match your reality. Church, I'm here to tell you today, what too many saints are saying does not match their reality. Oh, we have a move of God in our church. Honey, you're saying that, but it doesn't match the reality. Oh, my pastor's anointed of the Holy Ghost. No, what you're saying does not match the reality. You're saying you're full when in fact you're not. And just saying you are doesn't make it so. You ought to be hungry for more, rather than being satisfied with what little bit you've got, you ought to be hungry for more. Our church isn't full today like it ought to be. Because too many people are sitting in dead old dry churches. Too many people are sitting in churches where preachers preach for the paycheck. Too many pe uh, people are sitting in churches today where... People shout and dance and carry on and then they go out and cruise and whore it up and drink and smoke and because they're just playing the game. Well, at this church I can play the game. I can't go to Brother Charles' church because uh, he don't play. I preached one time at an affirming uh, uh, Pentecostal uh, conference down in Louisiana. It was the first conference of that nature that I had ever been to. And there was a man and his partner in that meeting who had been in the affirming. See, I didn't know when I started affirming ministry. I didn't know there was any such thing as affirming Pentecostals. Turned out that there had been a group of them for about a decade already, but I had no idea. Well, when I learned about them, I went to their conference, and uh, they asked me to get up and speak one day. And I got up, and I shared some thoughts, and I spoke. And there was a man who had been part of that movement since the beginning, from the beginning. And after a while, a couple weeks later, Brother, I uh, can't think of his name, he called me on the telephone one day. He said, my partner and I would like to come to New York, and we'd like to visit you and your church. Would you mind if we came and visit? I said, oh, I'd love the fellowship. I'd love to spend some time with y'all. That'd be great. So they came up and they stayed in my home and they came to our church and he plays piano. So he was able to play piano for our worship services. We had a great time. And he told me when he came, he said, brother, I'm going to be honest with you. When you got up and spoke at that conference down there in Louisiana, he said, you scared the life out of me. You absolutely scared the life out of me. And I said, well, gee, thank you. I, I guess that's a compliment. I don't know. He said, do you know why? I said, no, I can't say I do. He said, because when you spoke, I felt an anointing on you that I haven't felt in years and years and years. He said, brother, you had an anointing on you. He said, my father was a United Pentecostal preacher. He said, you had that old-time Pentecostal apostolic anointing. He said, I felt like I was in church 30 years ago. And here you were an affirming apostolic preacher. He said, and I listened to what you had to say. He said, and the first thought went through my head was, oh, dear God, that preacher believes every word he's saying. He said, you weren't playing. There wasn't nothing about you playing games. There wasn't nothing about you messing around. You were as sincere as a heart attack. He said, you know why that scared the life out of me? I said, no, I don't, because I have thought it was the greatest thing since sliced bread if I'd have come upon a preacher like that. He said, I'll tell you why, because I've been in the affirming Pentecostal movement for over 10 years. He said, and quite honestly, that is not the spirit that we operate under. 
We're all about playing church. We're all about getting people to shout and dance and, you know, act like they're having church. He said, but we're not about living the life. We're not about really being Christian and being devout and being sincere and experiencing the best of God because we're giving God our best. He said, that is not what this movement has been. He said, and when you got up there, it was obvious to me right from the starting line, oh my goodness, this man ain't playing no games. He is as sincere as a heart attack. He said, but my partner and I went home from that conference, and we talked, and we said, you know what? I want what he's got, not what we've had. Hallelujah. Oh, I want more of what Brother Charles has got, not just what we've been. I don't want to keep playing the games. I want to get real with God. I don't want to keep uh, uh, claiming there's an anointing, claiming there's a move of God when there really isn't. I want the real thing. They came to New York, and we had two church services on Sunday, and they were there for the two church services. They were supposed to go home Monday. They couldn't go home. They had to stay an extra day or two because we had such wonderful fellowship, and everything was so sweet. I want to tell you today, folks, too many people in our movement are saying something like the church at Laodicea that isn't so. They're saying I'm rich and increased with goods and in need of nothing. But according to the Lord, if they could only see what God was seeing, they're naked, they're wretched, they're poor. If only they could see from God's perspective, they'd realize that there is no anointing. There is no power where there ought to be power. There is no anointing where there ought to be anointing. There is no move of God where there ought to be move of God. But it's available to us. If we'll be hungry for it. The word of God said in Matthew 5 verse 5. Blessed are they. Which do hunger and thirst. After righteousness. For they shall be filled. See. You can't get nothing that you're not hungry for. God don't fill anybody with the Holy Ghost. That isn't hungry for the Holy Ghost. God don't heal anybody that isn't hungry for a healing. God doesn't move by his power in a church where the people are not hungry for a move of God, where they're not hungry for the power of God, where they're not hungry for the manifestation of the Holy Ghost. Oh, but if you'll be hungry, God said, I'll satisfy you. Hallelujah. If you'll be hungry, you shall be filled. Glory to God. The word of God tells us to follow peace with all men in holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. This means that we ought to nurture a hunger after these things, not claim that we've had our fill. Just because you make a claim does not make your claim a reality. What you say and what you and what God sees are often entirely opposite. I'm going to tell you, Johnny, I'm still, I've been in the Pentecostal movement my entire life, and I'm still hungry for the move of God. I've been in the Pentecostal movement my entire life. I still want a church where the Spirit of the Lord falls like rain, where Pentecost is not something we talk about, but it's something we experience. I still want that. That's one reason why today I'm so melancholy. That's one reason why today I'm struggling so hard in the work that I'm doing because for all these years, I'm not for one minute have I been satisfied with what we have. But I have my sight set on something more. Jesus has the table spread where the saints of God are fed. He invites his chosen people, come and dine. I'm hungry. For so much more. I want so many. And it, it's not about how many people are in the pew. It's about the move of God. It's about the power of God. It's about the manifestation of the Holy Ghost. One day I'm going to be able to look at the Lord and say, Thank you, Lord, I've eaten. You know when that day is? Right this. Uh, this is my favorite passage in the entire Word of God. I want it on my tombstone. I've told Tommy. As for me, Psalm 15, 17, 15. 
As for me, I will behold thy face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I awake with thy likeness. Hallelujah. Yeah, one day I'll be able to look at the Lord and say, okay, Lord, I'm full. All right, Lord, now I've had all I can take. I can't take anymore. But that day...